that was good. Have you ever heard the old saying, if you're feeling far away from God, who moved? Ever heard that before? There's one thing we know about God. We know that God is steady. God is dependable. God is the rock. He's in the same place and He doesn't change, does He? So if we're feeling far away from God, who moved? It's me. It's you, right? Because we're the ones that stray. We're the ones that drift away. In the Psalms, in Psalm 16, verse 11, you read these words. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty good, don't it? Right? Fullness of joy, pleasures forevermore. Why would anyone ever want to be away from that? Right? But yet, what do we do all the time? Slowly, you know, it don't seem to happen overnight, right? You know, I know, I know you've heard the saying, Rome wasn't built in a day, right? You know, a Christian doesn't drift in a day, I don't. It happens over time. So if we're feeling far away from God, it's not because God's changed, it's because we've changed. In the same book of the Psalms, or rather the same chapter of the Psalms, just a few verses prior in verse 8, you read these words though. I have sent, this is Psalm of David, David wrote these words, he said, I have sent the Lord always before me. He goes on a few verses later there to say that whole fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. So why do we think David was able to say that he, what, that he had these fullness of joy and these pleasures forevermore? <coughs> because he had set the Lord before him in all things. If God feels far away, who's moved? It's us, right? We've moved far away. We have prevented ourselves or kept ourselves from setting the Lord before us. Now I'm sure that any Christian would agree that in the presence of God, yes, there is fullness of joy. Yes, there is love everlasting. Yes, there is, um, what did it say? <laughs> I lost my place. There is pleasures forevermore. Yes, when we are in God's presence, yes, when we are seeking God, yes, when we are going after Him with everything that we are, it's a good thing, isn't it, Christian? Amen. Well, why do we let ourselves drift away then? If we know that in God is all of this goodness, why do we let ourselves drift away? Well, that's a question only you and God can answer. But there is a question that I can answer. And there's a question that I can use the Scripture to give you a good, solid, biblical foundation to answer on. And it's the question of why should we? How do we? put the Lord before us in everything that we do. David wrote again in verse 8, he said, I have set the Lord before me always. Because He is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. We know David had his ups and his downs, right? Right? For sure. We know we have our ups and our downs as well too, don't we? We have moments when we make poor decisions. We have moments when we make decisions that we think are fully within the will of God. We may have even prayed about it and think that this is what God wants me to do. But then we see, hmm, maybe things didn't turn out the way that I thought it would. We talked briefly in Sunday school about, you know, is it, is it something that, we, you know, are we being punished for our wrong? Or is it just simply the consequences of what we've done? I believe it's consequences, don't you? When we do wrong, I believe we reap the consequences. You don't plant apples, or you don't have an apple tree expect to get oranges from you, even though that is on the cover of our lookout for today. It's really ironic. <laughs> when that was brought in there, we've been talking about that. Oh, look, apples and oranges. But the point of the matter is, you don't plant corn and expect to get beans. You don't do evil and expect it to turn out for good. You don't sin and expect it to work in God's favor. You don't drive like a maniac and expect to arrive safely, right? You don't learn Russian and expect to go speak Spanish in Mexico. You have to prepare for the task at hand. You have to prepare yourself for what it is. We know that our task at hand is to live like a called out people in a fallen world. There's only one way to do that, isn't there? The only way to live the way that God wants us to live in a world where everybody's doing everything except that is to always keep our eyes on the prize, to always keep our eyes on our Father, to always keep our eyes on Jesus. Amen. 
I played baseball most all of my life. Coached for a couple of years when I was at Shelby Valley. I haven't played or anything like that in a long time, except in a student faculty softball game last year where us old people showed those young kids how it's done. <laughs> faculty beat the students at Belfry 28 to 6. But I played ball, I played baseball my whole life. And the one thing you learn in baseball is you always keep your eye on the ball. Whether you're up to bat, whether you're in the field, you know where that ball is at all times. You know what happens when you don't know where that ball is at all times? You're going to find out real fast where that ball is when you don't know where it is. When I was 10 years old, I caught one with my left eye. Not my left hand glove, but my left eye. I found out real quick where the ball was when I wasn't keeping my eye on it. Why do we do the same as a Christian? We know that God is our source. We know that God is our, is our refuge, that God is a source of our strength. We know that He provides what we need. We know that He is the outlet to our drained battery. Why do we not keep our eyes on Him? Why do we not seek Him always before us? Psalm 16, verse 8, again, I've set the Lord always before me because He is at my right hand. I shall not be <coughs> Before we go on, let's pray. Our Lord in heaven, we're thankful for the day you've given to us, and I pray that you'll help us to always keep you first, to keep you in front of us, to keep our eyes on you, Father, because we know that you won't lead us astray, that you won't let us fall as long as we seek you. And God, I just, we live in a difficult world. We live in a place where there's so many negative things, and Lord, we know that we need help. We're so thankful that you've provided it, that you're there for us, that you're there to guide us. I just pray that you'll help us to seek it. Help us to keep our eyes on you, Father. I pray that you'll be with us through this lesson today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So how do we do it then? How do we keep our eyes on God, right? You know, when you're playing baseball, it's pretty easy to keep your eye on the ball. Open your eyes and watch where the ball is, right? <laughs> Pitcher throws the ball, you watch it go to the plate, right? Batter hits the ball, you watch where it goes, right? You keep your eye on the ball. It's a literal, physical thing, right? It's this little round sphere, it's usually white or when it's off, it might be bright yellow, but wherever it is, it's easy to follow the ball, right? That ain't true for all sports, is it? Again, I've been teaching at Belfry for two years. What is Belfry known for? Football. Let me tell you what I know nothing about. Football. That is the hardest game in the world to know where the ball is. Anybody knows anything about football, I would probably agree with you, or you'll probably say, well, if you ever learned how the game works, you'd figure it out. But for me, thinking like a baseball, or I've even tried to play basketball in my life, either of those games, it's pretty easy to follow the ball. Baseball, you know, if, it's, if something nothing's going on, probably the pitcher's got it or somebody, right? You know, the batter's going to try to hit it. Basketball, you know, somebody's probably either dribbling it or shooting it, right? Football, though. If, I, I tell you, I think there's times they've always put it up in their jersey and do things with it. You don't know how many times I stood on the sideline watching our team play, and I'll be watching, and I just know that that guy's got the ball. Next thing I know, somebody down here scoring a touchdown. Come on. How does that even work? Well, the good news is God ain't like that, is it? God's not pulling any kind of trick plays or anything like that. He is very straightforward, isn't he? If we want to keep our eyes on God, what do we need to keep our eyes on? God's Word, right? We keep our eyes on God's work because God, for us, in 2016, this is where we find Him. Amen. Now, right? Amen. We hear we hear God's Word taught, but I hope everything I say, if I quote a scripture, if I say, you know, the Bible says this, I hope you check up on me. Right? Please, please. The Bible says we're no more noble for doing that, right? The Koreans were more noble than the Thessalonians because they did that very thing, right? And I hope that the East Pointians are more noble than whoever doesn't do that, Right? If I say something, check it. If Aaron says something, check it. If Bobby Jones says it, really check it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I love Bobby. I can't say anything bad about it. But, uh, but no, we know that we know where to find God. We don't have to wonder where he went. We don't have to wonder what happened to him. We don't have to wonder who hacked him and hit him somewhere and they're falling back to throw a touchdown pass. We don't have to worry about that. If we want to find God, all we have to do is open our eyes. Right? To keep our eyes on God, we know where to find Him. So how do we set the Lord before us then? David said that was the key, right? David said the key of, and right there, right before the, the, the Scripture text, I use in verse 11, is verse 8, where he said the key is because he set his eyes on the Lord. Because he set his eyes on the Lord, he had all these blessings. How do we do that? I want to look at three ways that we set our eyes on God. 
Okay? And we set ourselves, we set the Lord before us in everything we do. The first one is God's creation. Have you ever just stood in awe of God's creation? Man, I have. I have. There have been places that I've gone and, you know, and, and for different people it's different things. Some people, it just blows them away. I'll never forget my wife the first time I took her to the beach. She never been to the beach after we got married. Taking her around, her just seeing the ocean. And all the vastness of the ocean. And just, you look and you can't see the other side. You know, there's, I mean, it's just, just, I mean, you know, you can stand in awe of the beach and of the ocean and of the waves and how God's power, how there's so many creatures in that water out there that you don't even see. It's amazing to think what God has done. Maybe for you it's a mountain view. Maybe it's standing you know, at, at the breaks at fall when all the leaves change colors and looking out and seeing all that, all the beauty of God's mountains and the colors and the creation that God, God has created for us. Maybe it's the sky. Maybe it's the night sky on a clear night in the middle of nowhere. See, we live there so we can do these things, right? And we look up and we see billions upon billions of stars. And to think that God created that just for me to look at. You ever thought about that? Why is all that out there? Why is all that out there? Oh, science will give you a thousand different answers of big bangs and all these different things and is there life out there? And I say, no, I know why it's out there. Because God loves me. And God knew that one night I was going to look out there and I was just going to be in awe of how awesome it is. You ever thought about that? Billions upon billions of stars and galaxies and meteors and asteroids and whatever else is in space that is up there, including airplanes that blink that I think is the North Star that my wife still gives me a hard time about to this very day. <coughs> and them alone on the beach on our honeymoon. Look, I knew the North Star. Blink, blink, blink. There it goes. <laughs> Like years later, I still don't know about that. But you ever thought about why God made all this? He did it for you, didn't he? Right? But how many times do we not even notice what's around us? Guilty, right? We live in a beautiful part of the country. I know we tend to, you know, maybe, maybe we get tired of looking at these mountains, but have you ever left these mountains? For any extended amount of time. I ain't talking about a week in Myrtle Beach. Have you ever left these mountains for an extended amount of time? <clears throat> you want to get back to them? I was pretty glad to come home to these mountains when, after spending four months in Florida. As beautiful as Florida is in places. I was ready to come home. God created this for us to look at. God created this for us to enjoy. This creation tells of God's Glory. Psalm 19, verse 1 and 2. David says these words, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Day and day it utters speech, and night and night it reveals knowledge. The creation of God shows how powerful and awesome and amazing and how steady and true and faithful He is as well. Right? The wise man built his house upon the rock. Right? God created that rock. God created it to be firm. God created it as something that stands there. Both a literal rock and a spiritual rock as well, but God created that. The, the creation impresses us with God's ability, doesn't it? If you truly respect it, if you truly look at it, you can be amazed at how God created things. My wife sent a picture, she posted it on Facebook or something, I don't remember, of a bug she caught on the down porch. She wanted to kill it because you know, it's a bug and she don't do bugs, but she was afraid because she thought it was a spider. I said, honey, six legs, not a spider. But this is the weirdest looking thing I've ever seen in my life. Its body was hollow. Like there was nothing inside of it. It was like just a shell, but there was nothing inside of it. It looked like a stink bug, but it had big, long, spindly legs. It was weird. I don't know what it was. A mutant bug. But anyway, regardless, God created that weird little bug for me to look at and, huh, that's interesting. Right? God created these things because He knows that we're going to see and we're going to be amazed at what He has done. We're going to be amazed at what He has done. Romans, verse, uh, Romans 1 and verse 20, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen. The creation shows God, doesn't it? Being understood by the things that are made, that's us, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they, us, are without excuse. If you look at God's creation, there is no questioning God's power, is there? There is no questioning God's ability to do what God says He does. There is no questioning God's awesomeness. When we take the time to contemplate it, we understand more of His power. We understand more of who God is. And this power, or this understanding rather, enables us to come closer to Him. One of the most beautiful places that I've been in my life, and it's beautiful to me for a lot of different reasons, is the CCYC. If you've ever been to the Church of Christ Youth Camp in Grundy, you know what I'm talking about. 
You just look out over those mountains and you see everything that God has created. It's beautiful. But it's beautiful not just because it's a beautiful location, but because of what God has allowed to be done there for so many years. Not just I mean, in relationships that still go on. It's not, you know how many people I know from some of our churches in Pike County that met because they met at the camp. At the camp. Ian Kelly, <laughs> Shane and Bethany Locker. I mean, there's, there's plenty of others I can mention too. It's amazing the things that God does. All because of his creation. And you know what? Jesus utilized this as well. Jesus utilized the awesomeness of God's creation as a way to, to not just you know, to enjoy the view, but to accomplish something as well, right? Matthew 14, 23 is one example. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Right? There's solitude about being with God and with nature, right? And Jesus knew that. Did Jesus have to do that? No, Jesus was God incarnate, so he kind of had that direct link that... I mean, we have a direct link through prayer, but I imagine he had a high-speed connection kind of thing, you know, because, I mean, it's Jesus, right? And, but yet he still saw the need to distance himself, right? to distance himself from the world, from the chaos, from the people, right? You ever want to do that? And I'm surrounded by people all day long, okay? Sometimes I'm not much of a people person. I'm surrounded by people all day long, young people. So sometimes I just want to just go away, just go away. <laughs> Give me some time. But the point of the matter is, God's creation is a shining example, isn't it? God's creation is one way that we can look at as a way to keep our eyes on God by simply keeping our eyes on what God has made for us to look at. You know, we hold a newborn baby. Some of us are going to pretty soon. <laughs> and uh, you can't look at a newborn baby and not see what God has done, can you? Most helpless little being that there, there really could be. But they ain't nothing like me, there is it? I look at my big, chunky, 15-month-old, and I still think the same thing. I still think of her as a baby because she refuses to walk. Walk good. I think she realizes once she walks, she has to walk everywhere. So she's like, eh, hey, just carry me. She looks my little fat lady. She's like, just carry me around. I don't care about this. God's creation can only tell us so much about him, though, can't God's creation can tell us a lot about him. But he can only tell us so much. Sometimes, when we need to draw closer to God, we need to draw closer to the source, don't we? And today, for us today, that source is, as we mentioned just a few moments ago, His Word. <laughs> so the second way we draw closer to God is we draw closer to God's Word. God's Word provides not just the glimpse of God's power like we see when we look at creation, not just the, hey, look what God is able to do. It provides the whole story. I think of uh, Paul Harvey who's come on the news all the time. That's the rest of the story. Sometimes we need the rest of the story, don't we? Sometimes we need the whole story to know what's going on. And in God's Word, we get it. We get what God has there for us. Nature, through looking at nature, through studying nature, through studying the creation, we're limited in what we can learn about God. It's only through the divine revelation of His Word that we fully know who God is and what His will for us is. Ephesians 3, verses 2 through 5, if indeed... You have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given for, to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already, by which when you read it, you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. That's why the scriptures are there for us, isn't it? Because God provided him as a revelation of his will, of his plan, of his goal for mankind. God's goal for us, God's will for us, isn't just for us to sit back and enjoy the beauty of what he created. We should do that. But that's not it, is it? God's goal, God's will for us, is that we enjoy what he's created for hereafter as well. That we accept the gift of his son Jesus, the gift of his salvation, that we accept that. And that we study His Word and we put it into action. And that these things are written down for us to use to know who God is. Jesus used God's Word as a tool and as a weapon as well, didn't He? God used, or Jesus used it as a way to ward off the devil. When He was tempted after being in the desert and being hungry, right? How did He respond to the devil? With Scripture, right? Matthew 4, verses 4, 7, and 10. These are just Jesus' answers. He said, and he said, or he answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then in verse 7, Jesus said to him, It is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And then again in verse 10, Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone only shall you serve. 
Jesus was fond of the scripture and the devil and the devil tempted him. And we have the same resource for us, don't we? <laughs> Let God's word help you draw near to him. Because he is our source, isn't he? He is our source of our power, of our strength, of our being even. And thirdly and finally, we don't need to just listen to God. We do need to listen to God. I'm not saying that we don't listen to Him, but we don't need to just <coughs> listen to Him. We talked about it in Sunday school. We need to have a relationship with Him, don't we? We need to have a relationship with God. We need to have a two-way conversation. So we set the Lord before us in the way that we converse with Him, don't we? Through our prayers. You know, we have a gift that the people in the Old Testament would have only dreamed of having. Did you know that? We as Christians, born after the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have a gift that people in the old law would have only dreamed of having. We can talk to God ourselves. And not only can we talk, He promises that He hears us every time, and not even just that, that He answers us every single time. Did you know every time you pray, every time you pray and you pray for things you know, in the way that we should, God always answers. Sometimes he says no, don't he? Sometimes he says wait. Sometimes he says that infamous one we all hated here as a kid, maybe. <laughs> right? My house maybe always meant no. <laughs> I don't know about your house. You know, my mom said maybe that meant no, but I'm not going to be mean enough to say no. I'm just going to let you think I'm going to think about it, but it still really means no. Still does to this day. Mom says maybe she won't do it. <laughs> but we set the Lord before us through our prayers. A close relationship is a two-way street, right? Anyone who's been married for any amount of time knows that. If you don't communicate with your spouse, you're not going to be married very long, are you? Right? If you've been married any amount of time, you know that communication is key. Now, our relationship with God is often compared to a marriage, right? It's often compared to Jesus is going to come back to take his bride, the church, right? It's often compared to a marriage. And just like a marriage, a physical marriage here on earth, we got to talk. We've got to talk to make this relationship work. Oh, it's not because God's not going to do his part, because he's going to. But we've got to talk to him. Because we need to hear, we need to tell him our thoughts, our questions, our <coughs> wants, our desires. To express them to him so that he can answer them, so that he knows where we are. God knows all things, doesn't he? But he still wants us to talk to him. Just because he does know what we're thinking, just because he does know it before we ever utter the words, doesn't mean he doesn't want to hear it from us ourselves, right? A close relationship must be a two-way street. God has revealed himself through his creation, through his revelation, and we have to reveal ourselves to him through our prayers, through our, uh, the way we express ourselves, to receive these blessings that he's promised. Uh, Ephesians, uh, I didn't write it down. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Philippians 4, verse 6. I thought it was Ephesians. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your prayer, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. The scriptures tell us if we need something, if we need anything, tell God. Tell Him. Because He always answers, doesn't He? And He always takes care of us. Hebrews uh, 4 and verse 16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Why can we come boldly? Because we're children of the king, right, Christians? We're children, we're prince and princesses in this country, in this kingdom, right? In the kingdom of God, we are prince and princesses, brothers and sisters of Jesus, our older brother, right? We can come to God, our father, the king, without fear, without worry, knowing that he'll hear us, knowing that he'll listen to us, knowing that he'll answer us. We can approach the throne of grace boldly. We draw near to God through prayer. Jesus did the same, didn't he? When Jesus was at the most difficult moment of his life, what did he do? He prayed. And he prayed, right? Matthew 26, verse 36, is just one verse of the passage. Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I pray, while I go and pray over there. He didn't take them with him that time, did he? He wanted some privacy. He wanted some time to talk to God. And we know if we read the rest of the passage, it says that he sweat as it was drops of blood, right? Because he was, what was he praying for? Do you remember? What was Jesus praying for in the garden? If it 
it's your will, let this cup pass. But what did he say? If not, that will be done. My, oh, my, oh, my. An example that we get from our Lord and Savior of how to talk to our God and Father. Right? Jesus prayed in his most difficult moment. I don't know about you, but I'm guilty. I am guilty, guilty, guilty of forgetting to pray until it's too late. I'm not going to lie. I'm human. I make mistakes, and I know if you're honest with yourself, you probably do the same thing too, don't you? How often do we view prayer as a last resort? How many times have you heard somebody say, well, there's nothing else to do but pray about it? That should be the first thing we do, right? It shouldn't be the, well, I've tried everything else, now I'm going to try to pray. No. We should have been praying all along, shouldn't we? Christians are guilty of that as just as much as anybody else. I'm guilty of that as just as much as anybody else. To be doing everything that I know to do, to try to do everything Josh can do, to try to get everything in line the way Josh sees to do it, and then, oh, by the way, God, can you help me with this? No, that should be the exact opposite, shouldn't it? Now, I'm not saying we just pray and then we sit on our hands. No, that's not what our God expects us to do, is it? <laughs> our God expects us to be a working people, but he also expects us to be a praying people. We should pray first and then get to work. Right? That's how we communicate with God. In conclusion today, then, if we desire to draw near to God, if we desire to draw near to Him, then we've got to, we've got to set our eyes on Him, right? You don't expect to play a sport if you don't know where the ball is, right? You don't expect to be a good baseball player if you don't keep your eye on the ball, or a football player if you don't have any clue where the football is. That's why I'm not a football player. I wouldn't have any idea what I was doing. But the point of the matter is, if we want to draw near to God, we've got to keep our eyes on God. How do we do that? Well, three ways we can is by looking at his creation and remembering the power that he, that he has to have created it, by looking at his word and seeing what his will actually is for our lives, and by talking to him. Tell God. Tell him your prayers. Tell him your concerns. Tell him your worries. Tell him, Lord, I don't know what to do with this, but can you help me? Because he always answers us, doesn't he? The Bible says if we seek wisdom, he'll give it to us. Good measure pressed down, shaken together. I didn't write that verse down, but the rest of the He's, he's good to us, isn't he? He's good to us. He takes care of us. All we've got to do is seek him first. You know, the Bible tells us that the first step we do to seeking him first, obviously, is we have to seek him out. And the Bible tells us if we believe in him, that, you know, that, that we want to do make a change in our life, if we want to be different, if we want to be called out, that we've been called out, that if we want to do something about it, that we repent of our sins, that we confess before others that we believe in Jesus, that we are buried in the watery grave of baptism and have our sins forgiven once and for all because God doesn't remember anymore, right? And then we live our life for Him. We give our life to Him. We spend the rest of the time that we have here, whether it's short or whether it's long, whatever it might be, we spend our time living for Him. That's what the Bible tells us. That's what God expects us to do. He always answers us. He always hears us. We only seek Him first. We're going to sing our invitation.